Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the Warren Lecture Series. And today we have a distinguished speaker, Professor Suru Shah from uh, Northwestern University, where he is currently Walter P. Murphy uh, Professor Emeritus. Professor Shah is a member of National Academy of Engineering. He is also a foreign member of National Academy of Engineering of China and India. He is founding director of the Center for uh, Advanced uh, uh, Cement-Based Material, supported by the NSF. And uh, he's uh, also a uh, distinguished professor at IIT Madras and a member of Institute of, for Advanced Studies at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And I will not take more time from our speaker. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you so much. It's really great pleasure to be here. And my main motivation is, of course, to find out what's happening and quite impressive and I if I knew before and I might have emphasized more on our common interests I was talking with Santiago and few others but maybe during the discussion uh, so the you know trans some of you know transportation research board and I was asked uh, at TRB to they said can you summarize what's happening in concrete technology for last 100 years. And I said, 100 years, that's too much. How about 50 years? Because I got my PhD in 1965. <laughs> so they said, OK. You, I, so I'm going to, but it's obviously very selective. Even, you know, some of, uh, and I mentioned some of the things that I haven't covered. But I hope, I want to, if what I'm presenting makes a good story. And that's what I hope to do. And uh, let me. Uh, so I don't know where, sh is there a remote button so I don't come in the way now, huh? Or I could sit down? Oh, yeah, sorry, no? no, because I don't want to be let uh, in the way. I don't know what to do. Maybe I sit down. No, you're, you're fine, fine. You're Pardon? Fine. I'm fine? Yeah. OK. So I want to talk about what improvement we have made in, of course, how strong the material can be, make them less brittle. One way is, of course, fiber reinforced composite. Also, how to make concrete more constructible. And that's really uh, somewhat more recent emphasis, quite important, for example, in super tall building. And then I, I wish I would, I would have liked to emphasize more here, knowing some of the interest here from the, what is the things are happening at the nano scale. So I think if you look, at the strength, when I started my PhD, we were talking about 20 megapascal. And now we are talking about 200 megapascal. 10 times increase with really not such a significant increase in cost. And the most, uh, most obvious example of this is that now all the super tall buildings, taller than three to 500 meter are made with concrete. And this is the, as you know, is the Boots Dubai, which is 800 meter and made with concrete. And w what's the I basic idea? Well, you know, to make concrete, you need water to harden it. And the chemical reaction requires, if you look stoichiometry, not much water, but to make it fluid. We had a lot more water, that means pores. So the basic law is that less the amount of water as measured by water to cement ratio, higher the strength. But if you use too little water, then not fluidity, a lot of air void, and actually strength goes down. So this is why we did not, weren't able to go follow that curve. But with a couple of uh, uh, advances, and these are, Demonstrate here. If you take normal concrete cement and water, the, the cement form flocule and the water gets entrapped, and we call those capillary voids there in the micron, and they do not resist any stresses and actually make material porous and permeable. So that's I call vanilla concrete. Then with the development of surfactant. So these are, uh, they are, people call it super plasticizer. 
they give electrostatic charges and steric hindrance and those people who are working in colloidal uh, science can understand it. We disperse the material so we reduce the size of the voids. There's still some void left. So the next step is fill up those voids with submicron size particle. The average size of cement is 20 micron. So when you do that, and one of the submicron particle which is most common is called silica fume, and that comes from the waste industry and that's more common. So with this, I call it microstructure manipulation, we can make concrete now compressive strength up to 300 megapascal without increasing temperature or pressure. So that's, that's a remarkable improvement. And I, the commercial exploitation of this technology was started in Chicago with, because in high rise building, you can use, even though it might be more expensive, so-called high strength concrete because the footprint column size is less and the usable area is more. And so when I was started in Chicago, those two buildings were made with concrete. And of course, then you see as the years go by, the height of the building made of concrete keeps going. And I've not shown here, but the, there is a building now under construction in Saudi Arabia called Kingdom Tower, which will be one kilometer tall. So that's where the that strength is going. But then, especially in northern part of this country and Europe and elsewhere, we realized that obviously strength is important, but durability, and especially with bridges. As you know, with bridges, you add uh, salt so that snow melts. The salt, concrete being porous, goes inside the concrete and when chloride ion touches reinforcing bar, they corrode, corrosion product expand and you have a big problem. So we paid a lot more attention to transport properties or durability. And we often call that high performance concrete. So we realize the strength is important, but durability is more so. And what was important lesson that we find, people assume that stronger the concrete, more durable. Well, it's not necessarily so. So we need an independent measure. And one of them is the chloride permeability measured by, by the applying the electrical conductivity measured in charge. And here I've shown compressive strength and versus this measure of durability. And you can see there is no relation in this select set of data. And so people realize that now highway department, as you know, specify what should be, for example, uh, the chloride permeability in addition to strength. So that's a, that's a major improvement. Then why, how I got into high strength concrete and knowing that the ferrets are here, I think I would like to mention that. So this was a water tower building you remember, Joe, it's very it's an iconic building as far as the, uh, the, uh, uh, it's a concrete building. And the, 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 the company, ready mix company, that was called Material Service. And they told SOMs, Kidmore, who were designing this, that we can give you 90 megapascal. So they said, fine, show us. So they did. And then they tested it in their lab. And as you will see, they, you know, they called it high strength concrete. And this is around 90, I think, or a little more, 110. But it failed catastrophically. So they said, well, we can't use that for a structural material because it fails catastrophically. So that time, uh, this was before closed loop MTS. So we said, how can we show that this response is not only a material property, but it depends upon testing machine and uh, specimen interaction. So we developed this tech to show them the concrete cylinder was tested in parallel with the steel tube. The steel was designed to be elastic up to large enough strain. And from, so you, it elastic, so from knowing the, put the gauges on the steel 
you can calculate what is the response of concrete. And we showed that you can get strain softening response even with 90 megapascals. But then, you know, uh, uh, I just wanted to show we develop a paper, and I, I did have more hair than, than shown, shown, shown here. So that was the, with, yeah, some of you know Tony Naman, right? Yeah, he was. So then, you know, with the, uh, 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 with the development of this uh, uh, circumferential expansion, we can show that, you know, if you use you saw the specimen expand laterally. So if you load it to control the circumferential expansion, then you can get, you know, closed loop response. And then I think in around 95, uh, we tested this 200 megapascal concrete in this circumferential control. And you can see that we get a very controllable response. But certainly, material is more brittle, higher the strength. And this, I will talk a little bit, little bit now. But this one is now quite a bit into uh, vogue. It's called UHPC, ultra high performance concrete. Lot of works along uh, it uh, in Germany and now in Japan and here where we define, American Concrete Institute defines ultra high performance as concrete with a compressive strength greater than 150 megapascal. And this concrete um, will come to it so strong that it can, it's very brittle. So it must have fibers for structural use and we will talk about it later. So I want to talk a little bit about fracture mechanics after visiting uh, a rock mechanics lab, I thought it would be good to. And my interest in fracture mechanics started, uh, you know, I, I did my part of my work at Lehigh where there George C. and uh, Irvine, the fracture mechanics was big. So if you look at classical linear elastic fracture mechanics, the smaller the flaw size, higher the fracture strength. So we said if instead of reinforcing bar, which are spaced quite far apart, if we use randomly distributed fibers, and if they're closely spaced, then following Griffith, we can increase substantially the tensile strength. So you know, those times, the commercial level fibers primarily were steel fibers. And we used it, and we found no increase in fractured strength with fibers. And the reason now is that flaws in cement and concrete are in the micron size. And the fibers are spaced, even fibers are spaced, you know, in the millimeter scale. So you start the flow, and by the time the crack reaches here, it's already the peak of tensile strength. So we did not see any improvement. But what happens if you look at the tensile response of fiber reinforce and a normal, there is currently using fibers, and I will come, there is no increase in modulus. We are talking about at most couple of percentage by volume. So, and there is no increase in tensile strength, not noticeable, but big increase in post P. And so, for example, if you look at the area under the curve, so very important. And as a result, fibers are increasingly used. I think it's a billion dollar industry. And so that's the uh, what. But then how do we measure the fracture toughness of concrete? And this happens, applies to rock too. And I don't think we have still reached a way to determine fracture parameters which are independent of the specimen size and geometry. So people are still struggling. And th th that's good, we have to know. And one of the reasons, and <clears throat> you can see that in the Rock Mechanics Laboratory, whether do acoustic emission or digital image correlation, if you have a flaw or artificial knot, before the peak, you have this 
so-called slow crack growth or fracture process zone. It's more pronounced in concrete than in rock because of heterogeneity. The grain size are much larger. So when you reach peak, the crack is this long and not that. So that makes calculation difficult. Also, the crack is not traction free. So we are still struggling. Uh, one of the ways that I know the earlier work done rock mechanics and later on we did that we call from knowing the compliance in the beginning and at the peak you can calculate effective crack growth and that so it's uh, one way to get a material parameter more common for computational we assume that intention the peak is governed by classical tensile strength criteria, material is elastic. Obviously, that's a simplification. But then the emphasis on post peak. So when you are increasing tensile stress, even though you see a crack because of the traction, you get. So this becomes a material property, tensile crack. And that you can use it in numerical model. And so the emphasis as I mentioned with the fibers as well, is that crack is already formed. How can you constrain that crack from propagating or opening? And that's very important in structures. You want crack width as small as possible, both for aesthetic and for uh, transport properties. So for the highway department, we have developed this, which is now become an ASTM standard. How do you determine what is the cracking potential of material? So we developed this ring test. This is a steel. You cast concrete around it. And one of the major problems, say, in pavement and slab, is cracking due to shrinkage. Concrete wants to shrink. And here, of course, the steel ring will prevent it. So tensile stress is developed. It's a infinitely long axisymmetrical problem. So you find out when the crack forms and how wide the cracks are. So how different composition, different fibers. So this is both an ASTM and H2 step. So this is indirect way to determine uh, fracture toughness. And this is that and area under the curve are the two approaches which are used now. So let me, when we start, let me go talk a little bit about fiber reinforced concrete. As I mentioned, it's a, uh, increasingly uh, used uh, material. Very common are the steel fibers. Uh, also used quite a bit are the synthetic organic fibers such as polypropylene as well as glass fibers. Uh, the glass fiber replacement uh, came, uh, glass fiber in, uh, development came as a replacement of asbestos fibers. You know, asbestos fibers for so-called cement board are used quite a bit, not as much in US as in the rest of the world. And asbestos fiber has the potential of causing lung cancer. So one replacement could be glass fibers. And the normal e-glass fiber uh, are being negatively uh, chemically reacted with alkalis in cement. So they use, you know, this uh, zircon, special zirconia fiber, zirconia fiber called uh, alkali resistant glass fibers. Uh, steel fiber. Uh, I've shown here are the straight one, but the most common are developed by a Belgium company called Beckart, which has a hooks on both ends. And polypropylene fibers are also used as well as uh, PVA fibers. So these are the fibers used. And as I said, currently used fibers, we are talking one to two percent. The main idea is to post peak. And the reason is, as I mentioned earlier, and maybe I will repeat it here. So let me show you, to show you where I'm going. If you do a tensile test of concrete, 
then or you get a curve like that. I don't know why this should have been gone from zero. But you find out there is a peak and then there is a post peak. And if you look at uh, using DIC or uh, laser speckle interferometry, you find out that there are tiny, tiny micro cracks. They coalesce here in a big crack, and then if, and it's widening of that crack, it gives you strain softening. And if you use fibers, I call them macro fibers, then you don't change this much, but you get post peak. So we said, if macrofiber do not interact with microfibers. Why not use fibers at a micron scale? And that's what we did. And we used PVA fibers. Oops, what happened here? PVA fibers, these were two millimeter long and uh, 14 micron in diameter. And you can see the, in fact, we have increased the tensile strength. And if you design it right, you can get people called pseudo strain hardening. And to see that material is indeed flexible, I think I had a picture here, and this was in 1995 that you can see. I used to, I don't know whether I showed you in, in the class that people I asked my students, what is this material? And they say it's rubber, but it's actually cement reinforced with it. So this material now, as I mentioned, is used in this UHPC, ultra high performance concrete. These are for some pictures I borrowed from this uh, Japanese company and they have here a priestess concrete box girder with 300 megapascal. And this is one of the uh, technology being pursued, at, especially at the uh, research and development and some bridge constructions have been made. And so idea is that very dense material, we are talking about compressive strength, higher than 150 megapascal, and reinforced with fibers, so you get a uh, straight hardening type of response. So that you go from reinforcing bar to fibers to micro scale, and then why not the fracture starts at the nanoscale. Cement voids, the capillary pores, and even smaller. So many people, including my group, have been exploring carbon nanotube, carbon nanofiber, and people here have been also exploring graphene oxide, uh, graphene petalate. And we have been in using multiple carbon tube as well as carbon nanofibers. And these fibers, at the nanoscale, so they have a large surface area. So that means because of Van der Waal forces, they adhere very strongly. It's very difficult to disperse. That's a major issue. So sometimes, you know, the development happens by an accident. And so I had a student who was working, and she looked at the uh, other researchers, and they used what is normally used for fibers, like 1%, and you can see the increase in flexural strength is 22. So once she was making, measuring it, and she made a mistake in one decimal, and she added 0.1%. And 0.1% gave quite a bit higher response than 1%. So we said, well, how can that be? Well, the issue was dispersion. And so we worked quite a bit on dispersion, and the five carbon nanotube have to be functionalized, and then we use with ultrasonication. So now we have learned how to disperse it. And the idea is we rarely use more than 0.1 percent. And I was, we were talking and that with carbon nanotube, 0.1 percent they are percolating. And the advantage of 0.1 percent is obviously the smaller amount means. Uh, you can afford it in concrete construction. This is one of the results in the load versus crack mouth opening displacement curve. And what is shown here is cement mortar with water to cement ratio 0.5 and then 0.1% carbon nanotube and 0.1, the top yellow one is 
0.1% carbon nanofibers. So you find substantial improvement in flexural strength. This is on mortar. Now, we were su surprised that there is also increase in modulus. Now, you know, 0.1% is such a small amount that even if you assume that carbon nanotube has terapascal young modulus, you don't get what we have measured. So we said, well, okay, what else does carbon nanotube does? So this, we measured this autogenous shrinkage. Now, many of you are may not familiar, but you know, concrete shrinks when water evaporates. And that's a big problem. But when you use for high performance concrete, small amount of water, smaller than necessary, then there is internal desiccation, which is called autogenous shrinkage. And this is a key issue in so-called high performance concrete. And people solve this problem, for example, using saturated lightweight aggregate, which during curing provide water, or they are using so-called super absorbent polymer, which provide. So we measured this, so con there is no drying, but there is a shrinkage. So if you look water to cement ratio 0.3, and this is plain cement, and the red one with 0.048% of carbon nanotube, and you can see substantial reduction. And this is, and I will go, we don't clearly understand this, and this is where we need to talk about what happens at the interface, and I was talking with Sonia about the modeling, and I come back to this a uh, little bit later on also. And then, you know, when, when we presented this work, we started with cement, and we present to the, you know, people from, uh, practice and they said, well, we don't use cement, we use, we had sand and coarse aggregate, so we added, and we found out that the influence of carbon nanotube is higher with addition of sand than not. And that's again, I will come speculate that, now people know who are working with CNT and graphene that the conductivity goes up substantially because CNT are very conductive. In fact, we have shown that 0.1% of CNT increases conductivity by 100 times. So that could be a problem as far as rebar corrosion because galvanic current. So we measured using this test uh, the corrosion of plain mortar and then with 0.5%, 0.05% uh, uh, Point, this would be 0 0.05 and 0.1 percent of carbon nanotube. And what we found out that, in fact, see, this is control, and the other one is CNT 0.1 percent, and you measure potential, and the red line is the one above minus 350 ASTM says it's material. And you see, actually, the addition of carbon nanotube delayed, or in this case, up to 90 days, the 70 days corrosion didn't happen. So this was surprising, and we uh, clearly don't know why this is happening, but I will come to the one of the speculation a little bit later on at the, when I talk about nano. Now, we talked about improving talk, not in durability and toughness, and why strength, durability, and toughness are not necessarily related. But now I want to talk about constructibility, and that is primarily with the self-consolidated concrete. You know, when you con do concrete construction, vibration is a key parameter so that applying high shear stress make material fluid. But vibration has a lot of problems certainly related to safety of the labor, noise, and dust pollution. So this SCC is material concrete flows like water. So it can be pumped like water, 
And this is important in many, many applications, but especially in the super tall building. For example, if you look at Burj Khalifa, the last 100 meter is steel. And as Soham told me that that's the most expensive because the steel has to be uh, fabricated on ground and brought it up while concrete can be pumped. And there, uh, Burj Khalifa concrete SCC was pumped up to 600 meters. Now they are hoping uh, Samsung that they can pump a kilometer. So that's very important, not only in a tall building, but in horizontal pumping in a very uh, congested cities like Hong Kong. The ready mixed truck cannot travel as rapidly, so they're plant and then pump uh, one kilometer, as you know, yeah. So what, what is the idea of HCC? Well, you know, it's very simple. If you look at concrete as a fluid, so just as in solid, we have stress strain curve, where fluid, we have this shear stress versus different shear rate. And if it's water, it, it goes through zero, and the slope we call viscosity. Well, concrete shown in a red line, it doesn't flow like water. You have to apply certain stress before it starts flowing, whether you apply vibration. Or, and we call that yield stress. And material, the slope is called viscosity. Now, we can, we know, we want to reduce the yield stress. And we can do that by adding, of course, more water, which is not desirable, but we can add more of those so-called super plasticizer. But we want to do that without any separation or segregation, and that's the key. You don't want cement going one way and aggregate going other way. To, to demonstrate that, the, one of my PhDs a while ago, Aaron said, he did this experiment where we had a spherical ball on the top of a cement cylinder, fresh, you put it on the top, and then after it is hardened, we cut it. And these are the yield stress of cement paste. And you can change it by adding fine particles or super plasticizer. So you can see if the yield stress is very low, there will be a lot of segregation. Aggregate will sink. If yield stress is very high, it would not segregate, but it would not flow either. So based on this consideration, we have developed this essentially a window of SCC. Yield stress cannot be too low, cannot be too high. You can demonstrate the same thing with the, when it starts moving with the viscosity. And this is, in simple terms, the basic idea. So how do people uh, manipulate rheologies? Now, you can, as I said, super other people add viscosity modifying agent and very fine particles because that changes the uh, relative density because see these are normalized with relative density. So we have learned a lot and this is relatively new is how to measure and manipulate rheology. And this, this is becoming quite important certainly in pumping, becoming very important with the oil well industry. You know, one of the least understood part is the cementing in the oil world and how to control rheology and setting and other things. And now we have been talking about 3D printing where rheology becomes very important. So that's why I wanted to draw your attention. Now, one of the issues, there are you know, many things about HCC and I only want to add one interesting issue is that when you cast a tall structural, let's say column, when you do vibrated concrete, it's done slowly that by the time you reach top, there is sufficient solid skeleton. So the pressure at the bottom is less than hydrostatic because foam work is very expensive. With HCC, you can construct very fast and that's another advantage for contractor, time is money. But then if concrete is still liquid-like, then the pressure in the bottom would be hydrostatic. So we have been working 
along with other people, that can we maintain the fluidity but reduce the former pressure? And this can be done because once you start pumping or applying shear stress, the materials flocculate and it's called thixotropy. So we are manipulating thixotropy and fluidity. Here, for example, adding a small amount of nano clay. So this is the pressure, vertical and horizontal versus time after casting. We're talking about very small time, two hours, two and a half. And like to, this was done in MTS in a series of, you know, uh, casting this level, this level. So the top one is applied vertical pressure. The next to it, where it says NCO, no nano clay, is an FCC. They all had the same slum flow fluidity. And you can see that it's, it's normal FCC is not uh, water, so those two pressure are not the same. But when we add a very small amount of nano clay, you can see we have reduced this lateral pressure. And this is because we have increased thixotropy. And uh, there are other ways to do it, but this is so, and this becomes also very important as you, if you have seen any uh, videos of 3D printing, you would want the material flow out from the nozzle but maintain uh, its shape. And another uh, example, and Lev and I were talking about this, is in uh, slip from construction. You know, the, if you look at the paving operation, we have a dry concrete and then uh, when it comes out, it's a sh uh, shape, uh, in a matter of minutes, shape uh, uh, stable slab. And if you look at the various operation, one of them is the vibration. So can we remove the vibration in the slip cast paving? Now, so we said, we started with SCC. You cannot use SCC because then it comes out as a fluid. So then we manipulated adding nano clay. And we were able to show that you can remove the vibration using SCC concept. You can make, uh, uh, make uh, you know, sub, uh, highway pavement. And there are other app potential applications of this that we were talking about. So, we are, you know, we are now beginning to study what happens in the first few minutes after concrete is cast. You know, we call, what does concrete or cement solidify? What, you know, what are the mechanisms? Is it that the cement particles are percolating or what's happening? So to study that, uh, one of my, uh, former student who is now in Korea, he is working, developed this rheometer. Many of you are familiar with the concept. This is a parallel plate rheometer. So you have a material here, upper plate moves at the desired shear rate. And what he has done is has a window here in the bottom plate and there from which a laser light is uh, go through and measuring the backscatter light, you can measure the size of the flocule as they develop. So once you are shearing and you stop it, so we want to measure at the rate of flocule development would be uh, indication of thixotropy. And it's, uh, you can measure the cluster as small as a half a micron uh, with, with this method. So just couple of interesting results. So these are the probability plot of the flock size at uh, two different rate, one very, very slow, uh, 0.1 per second and one about 100 times fast. So when you are doing it very slowly, you can see that the flock size distribution moves to the right. This is, uh, you can see it, but this is in micron uh, particle size and that's its exotropy. But on the, if you do it very high speed, then the particles are dispersed more and the flock size 
decreases. And we we'll just started examining this. And the advantage of this is that you are measuring viscosity and the particle size distribution. So you can then calculate uh, using Krieger Doherty relationship packing density versus time. And you can see if you look at the curve to the right, red curve, packing density increases at a very slow speed or at a high speed. After a while, it goes down. And the, so I wanted to point out that this is very fruitful and critical area of study, the rheology. And what happens in the first few minutes becomes very important. Because now the, you know, people find out there is an interaction between the variety of chemical admissions and cement. And people don't understand that. And I, so th this is one of the ways that we are studying. So now I want to talk about uh, some work we are doing uh, to understand things at the nanoscale, especially with the mechanical property. So what you are seeing is the AFM picture, 60 micron by 60 micron, and the white one is unhydrated cement particle, and it's surrounded by one of the most major component of hydrated cement. It's called calcium silicate hydrate. That's really the strength giving component of concrete. And what we said, this is done in uh, high steel on nano indentometer, so you can do both SPM and indentation. So you can see, this is where we decided to indent. And the results from the load displacement and contact mechanics, uh, the modulus in gigapascal. So uh, these are plotted here. And I think you can you see that unhydrated cement particles has a modulus in gigapascal in three digit, while hydrated particles has modulus in two digit. So the pro process of hydration takes this relatively solid material and because of the morphology and other things, relatively weak material is surrounded. So it's clear if you want to make very, very strong concrete, you want a lot of those unhydrated particles and as little of hydrated particles, provided they're enough so they produce a three-dimensional percolating glue, and that's the concept of ultra high performance. We are using water to cement ratio 0.2 or less as compared to commonly 0.5 because you need super plasticizer and you have to control rheology. Another thing you notice that even at the nanos, relative nanoscale, CSH is not a single value. So how do you represent as a material property? So this was a concept developed by Franz Ulm at MIT that he's plotted this Young's modulus in a frequency plot. This is for cement paste with water to cement. Point five, and the, the, the distinction is not necessarily very universally accepted, but people say that at the very, the low end, you are talking about porous phase, and at very high, it's the calcium hydrocalcite crystals, which are, uh, you know, and the so average is something like 15 to 20. And people have shown that CSH has this kind of property. So, you know, people call this uh, DNA of CSH. So what we found when we added carbon nanotube, so here is the carbon nanotube and or, or and carbon nanofiber 0.048%. And you can see the material has become more stiffer. So addition of carbon nanotube has changed the nanostructure of CSH. And this is one of the explanation of why you know we have find higher modulus in uh, composite and also perhaps related to higher uh, lower autogenous shrinkage now we found we have just started it but when we measured the 
nano indentation values of the interface between cement, sand grain and cement. Normally you find a weak zone around it. But when we had CSH, there were, this is very preliminary, there are no weak zone. So that may be one reason. Same thing could happen among other things for the corrosion because you know corrosion starts as a passivating layer, it is at the nano. And if CSH has densified that, that could also, so this is, as I said, specul speculation. And we have to really understand better the relationship between CSH and carbon nanotube. And one of the ways I thought we could do is the method that Santiago has developed is with doing the AFM, but attaching CNT to the, uh, the cantilever and measuring. Now, I, I should also mention, because you are doing uh, nano indentation, that if you do a nano indentation, the size of the indent is in micron. And people do nano indentation, the spacing is also in terms of micron. But so what we are really measuring is an average property on a micron scale. So we have just finished and published our work. So we, so we could li do it, would like to do it better. So you could put very close spacing, let's say if you use AFM needle. But AFM is designed that the cantilever is extremely flexible. So if you have a soft film, perhaps it's okay, but not with harder material. So what we didn't develop it, other people, so you resonate the needle at its natural frequency and then measure the complex modulus. And then we can have a spacing very, very close. And so we have been doing that to get a better idea. We are also started using, and I don't know, you have this called atomic probe tomography. And this is a really, you give it 3D. So for example, you have to start, you need a conical shape specimen and using uh, focus ion beam you. So we take a clinker of that shape and we wanted to see what's happening at nano. So we put, for example, nano calcium carbonate and see, and then with the once you put the sample, then they are ionized and deposited here, and you get a 3D picture of at atomic scale of what's happening. So that's quite a bit of interesting work people are doing at the nanoscale, and I thought I would mention that. Now, as I mentioned, this is a very select summary. I didn't mention many things. Certainly, quite a bit of work being done here and elsewhere on developing sensors and also non-destructive testing. Uh, one of uh, Joe Labo's theory, uh, I mean PhD thesis dealt with acoustic emission. I didn't talk about it, but very interesting, you know, with the cement, we want to reduce the carbon dioxide emission. So a lot of work being done worldwide on reducing that. And for example, we are, you know, one way to we all know that we can replace cement with fly ash. But we are limited in the amount because let's say if you put a lot of fly ash, then the reaction slows down, which is not compatible with current construction method. So we find out if we add a very small amount of nano silica or nano calcium carbonate, it accelerates the hydration. And uh, it, it does some other things too. So a lot of work being done. I didn't talk about that. Nano modification and modeling. I didn't mention a lot of work being done, both at the molecular dynamic mod level as well as finite element and numerical constitutive modeling. So a lot of things I did, but I do would like to conclude with, you know, what what. What is uh, what people are now trying to do is clearly one is you want to crack free material, and uh, I, we talked a little bit about fiber reinforced concrete, carbon nanotube, and the so-called strain hardening composites. Constructability, 
we are improving that with self-consolidated concrete and pumping. Pump predictability that's becoming important. This is some of the model developed at NIST and Delft University, which mimics the hydration process, hydration kinetics, and other, and certainly monitoring is becoming very important. And then I had in sustainability, uh, supplementary cement material, nano modification, and also recycle concrete, more and more recycle aggregate. Uh, we are, the, the, the pressure of recycling is certainly more acute in countries like Japan and where they don't have place to dump, but here too, we are finally realizing that landfill is not the best way to do it. So recycle aggregate is another area where people are working on. And then f uh, maintainability, uh, one of the interesting area, I think I was mentioning to Santiago because his interest in combining uh, with the biology is the cell filling with the bacteria. Delft University and uh, uh, and in units in Belgium, Ghent, they have started this work. So if you have a crack and if you put a bacterial solution, the right bacteria, uh, which produce biomineral, they need calcium, which is provided by the cement solution, and you get calcium carbonate. <coughs> and uh, of course, uh, aesthetic and uh, economic. So th I thought that will give you just roughly broad sense what's happening in concrete technology. Thank you. When the presentation is recorded, so please identify yourself. I will stop by. Okay. <clears throat> So <clears throat> thank you very much for the excellent presentation. I have one question. Your high-performance concrete when you show unhydrated cement, but is it the best way of use cement just to get stiffness? It's a, can we, can we do something better than that? Especially you have to go ultra-high performance. Yeah. Ultra-high performance concrete doesn't have any aggregate because of the rheology. So coarse sand, and so you use a lot of cement. So that's what the lab's question is that, you know, what we want to, now people have shown that you compare a structure of certain size. You know, I, I don't have a picture, but the, the, the Lafarge, which is promoting this, they have shown you have, a, they cast beams, reinforced concrete beam, pre-stressed concrete beam, and ultra high performance concrete beam, and a steel beam, all having the same moment curvature relation. And the size, of ultra high performance is same as a steel beam. So you use quite a bit less material and they've done some calculations on, uh, you know, the life cycle analysis and they say it's less carbon dioxide because you use much less material. We are talking about increase of eight to nine times in the strength. But you know, the life cycle cost analysis are not always so straightforward, but I like to. So that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly a concern. But they say we should compare that with a steel cross section as far as the uh, energy and carbon dioxide. Just another question. In terms of use of nanotubes, there is a concern that when you start recycling those materials, they can get into environment. That's a good, but we are talking about 0.05% and they are embedded. So very, very, you know, I mean, unless you really pulverize it at the sub-micron scale, it will stay there in cement, but well, clearly, yeah, that's a concern. More questions? We can continue discussion afterwards right. on the, uh, during the reception. Please join me in thanking Soro for Wine and cheese. Wine and cheese, that always helps. Yeah. <laughs>